Um, let's start off. Talk to me about early on in your life. You know, how did you first get introduced to music, and you know, who influenced you? Um. Well, at first, I was I was raised in a in a very religious household. <clears throat> um, my family, like my uncle's a pastor. He's also it was like in a popular quartet group called the Gospel Clouds, <clears throat> and. Um, my mom and I, once my father divorced, even though this was my father's um, sister's husband, we all went to his church and he believed that we shouldn't listen to secular music. Okay. So, of course, that meant as a child, I wanted to find every secular song I could find when I wasn't around my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, thankfully the gospel, having the gospel music, but not typical gos gospel in a sense of like big choir music, but very much praise music and quartet music, which is a little different than, you know, uh, the James Cleveland, you know, that type of thing, even though I like that too. Um, and so after that, um, well, during that time, I would also go to Birmingham, Alabama, which is where I was born, um, every, just virtually every summer. And um, it was there that my cousins would play, you know, different songs and Groups and I'm like, who is that? And they're like, what? You don't know who the Gap Band is? And no, I didn't, you know. And even though they were like a huge, a popular group at the time, I didn't really know much about who anybody was because I was so sheltered. Yeah. Um, but um, also, my my best friend's brother had uh, uh, like a shrine to Prince in his room, and um, every time I would go to her house, I would just lose myself in his records uh, as well as her uncle. We would go to his house and I would just lose myself in reading the lyrics because I felt like I had to catch up on everything because I wasn't too familiar with it. I need to know what, exactly what he was talking about. And I fell in love with him at such a young age. Um, so I would just read his lyrics and listen to the records over and over and over again. And um, that's basically who I fell in love with first um, in terms of an artist um, and genre of music. Okay, cool. Um, your first major writing placement was uh, Destiny's Child, uh, Killing Time. Could you give me uh, the background on that song and how that opportunity came about? Actually, you know, my first major <clears throat> song was, was Gangsta Lean. Okay. Um, and that came well before, yeah, that came well before Killing Time. Yeah, that was, um, it was a group from, uh, I'm not sure, I think they're from Sacramento, but they were signed to MC Hammer. And it was uh, just a situation where I was in the, in the studio with a, a production team at the time called The Whole Nine. And um, they were, I was writing a whole, a completely different song. And then at the end of the session, they, they let me hear uh, the, the new, a new track that they were working on for the group that was coming in after me. Okay. And, um, and I just started joking around, um, you know, about something I had just seen on, you know, like Oakland was notorious for you know, pouring out a whole bottle of Hennessy when someone dies on the corner or leaving a, you know, a, sh a shrine of Hennessy and Coke 45 or whatever else, you know, leaving it um, on the corner with flowers and balloons or whatever. And, um, and I was actually like making, not necessarily joking, but just kind of that song reminded me because of the, the organs and it just reminded me of a funeral song. So I started writing about that. And um, when I actually moved to New York with my um, a group that I was in called Image. I was in the car with a friend one day and I heard it in the radio and I was like wow and that was like I think to date like one of the biggest singles that I've had mm -hmm. um, after that um, I guess well, then I released an album with the group Image and it, and it really it went brick but the experience exposed me to um to, to the real, to writing in a real sense, not just, you know, going to the studio and writing a song, like to write a whole entire record. It gave me um, that discipline. Nobody else could do it. And, you know, the other two girls in the, in the group could write as well. But for some reason, I guess because I, I, I had just been eating, sleeping and breathing writing, mm -hmm. um, that it fell on me, that responsibility fell on me. And I didn't take it lightly. And I studied so much during that time period. I also forgot to mention that when I was a kid, um, when my mom would leave, the only other option that I have to find secular music was MTV. Okay. Um, so I, would, I was very, 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 very much influenced by 80s New Wave and 
80s British black, black bands because I was, you know, a child in, in, in the 80s. So, um, um, so, but back to New York, I started writing. Um, I wrote this whole entire album and then we, came, you know, we did a, a couple of promotional tours and, and had a very good experience. And then when I got back to Oakland, I, you know, I, I never stopped writing and reaching out to the different people that I had worked with and met in um, New York. Like uh, we were signed to Black Sheep. Um, but, um, I became friendly with like De La Soul, a tribe called Quest and, and just, you know, kept friendly in those circles and Tony, Tony, Tony being that they were from Oakland and just working with them as well. But, um, so with Destiny's Child came about through Dwayne Wiggins, um, who at the time was working with them. I, I believe they were signed to his production company and he and I, Dwayne and I wrote the song Killing Time. We just... I came to a studio one day and he just had the guitar and it just came out and the lyrics were totally different because I was actually writing it about my ex-boyfriend who was like always high on weed. <laughs> 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 and so the, the, the song was like, you know, like I'm waiting for you. Like and when you, when you come back to reality or whatever. So obviously we had to change it because for this young group, we had to change some of the words once he actually um, put it on the group. And ironically, my ex-husband um, was a was a intricate part of the the development process for Destiny's Child. So he was like someone who they worked with early on. So um, yeah, that that was like a, a huge opportunity, and and definitely put me in a position to where you know a lot of a lot more people were paying attention to me as a lyricist. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> do you have a personal favorite song that you've written throughout the years? either for yourself or um, for someone else? Um, I have a lot of personal favorites that no one's heard yet. Okay. But um, on, on the Stone Rolling album for Raphael, we did a song called Go to Hell. And it's like, oh my God. And we also did a song called um, Just Stone. And it features um, the lead singer of, um, of um, Little Dragon. And so these two songs, I mean, I really love, um, especially Go to Hell. Like, lyrically, it's just like it was a, a breakthrough for, for him, so to speak, and like him, him having all these years in the industry and, um, and just, you. I don't want to give too much away. You have to go and get the record, but yeah. it's really, really a good song. But um, also there's a song called I'm Leaving that I wrote for Lisa Stansfield, and it was like, it was number one on the dance charts. And um, it was, I think it was like a very descriptive song. If you ever hear it, um, it, it kind of puts you, it makes you feel like you're talking to, I, I felt like I was talking to my girlfriend, which I, you know, essentially do when I write, I like to have a, fo a focal point, like who am I reaching in this? In this case, I was talking to, I felt like I was talking to my boyfriend and like, you know, like if you're going to a, through a situation where you, you start off talking to your girlfriend about what happened and what happened, but then in the middle of the song, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one second. Yep. <laughs> That's actually for a session. I just need to text her and let her know that I won't be able to um, to talk to her right now, but I'm still talking at the same time. Okay. So the song I'm leaving is, um, you have to Google that song and listen to it. It, it was like um, a really, really, especially for, for it to be so early on in my career. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a, um, a very powerful song. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, we all know that the sound of music today is, you know, different from what it was before. How hard is that for you, you know, as a songwriter? Because on one hand, you're trying to make music with substance, but on the other hand, you're trying to place as many records as possible. You know what? The latter isn't true. Um, I don't try and place as many records as possible. Okay. <clears throat> um, and and for, with that, I have to have um, like a, um, a Clark Kent, Clint, a Clark Kent and Superman type of life. You know, I have to do other things to supplement my lifestyle because I can't, I can't be a part of um, the thing. The I can't hold the murder weapon that's killing music right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's stuff that I just refuse to do. There's 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 a place in my mind that I refuse to go, and I'm not going to even go and write a song that 
first, A, I don't have the experience to even talk about some of the stuff that they're talking about these days. Mm -hmm. And B, I just know that historically it comes back around and, and it's, it's coming back around now. There's lots of good music coming out right now. Yeah. Um, so I just wait for it to come around. And fortunately enough, I've been able to, to weather the storm and then, you know, let it come back around, get a couple of cuts out there. And I'd much rather be, you know, that way than to be a huge songwriter um, without substance. Mm. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that aren't proud of what they say and do. And I'm very proud of everything that I put out there, even songs that started off as a joke, you know. But I, I'm very proud, especially then I was like just starting. Right now, I'm very conscious on uh, conscious about every decision, every word, every phrase, every prose, every e everything. I'm I'm very conscious about it. I, I'm well aware that um, these lyrics paint the uh, or the can or on the canvas. It's the canvas. It's the paint. It's the artist for our youth. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I have a sister who's 19 years old. <clears throat> she's growing up now, and I'm so thankful that she's able to. I'm, I'm able to be a good influence on her, and I wasn't out there writing songs like "Way to See Ma," you know, or something like that. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. not to say I don't love too short, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, now let's talk about your solo career. Um, you know, you mentioned that you were part of a group before. What was the transition like um, going from being in a group to being a solo artist? Well, it was all weird for me because I never really wanted to be a singer per se in the first place. Okay. Um, when well, when I was in my group, I think I just I love the camaraderie of, you know, being with girls. I, I was raised an only child um, from my mom's only child in the house with just my mom. My dad has um, a, I have a sister and a brother from my dad, but we weren't raised in the same house. So, um, and one of the other girls in my group, Braylee, she also was raised an only child. So we create, we formed a sisterhood. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I love more so than anything about that experience. So once our group broke up, we had an opportunity to, well, one of the girls wanted to go solo. That's, that's why we broke up. Okay. And, um, so then we, you know, we were, it was two of us left. We could have easily found another person and moved on, but I was over it. I'm like, oh, I'm good. You know, no, thank you. And then um, I just focused on writing. And at this time, and then after that, we moved to Atlanta. With my, I moved to, to Atlanta with my ex. <clears throat> and, and the solo thing came, up, came, up, came about, like, <clears throat> very strangely. I wasn't looking to sign a record deal. For, I got an offer from, <clears throat> um, um, I forgot the name of the label. <laughs> I got an offer from this one label. Um, and... I was like considering it, but mildly, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. And then the terms came, like, and I, and I thought it was horrible. I was like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, this is not modern day slavery. I'm not doing this. Yeah. And then I met this other lady. Um, she was a, a, a wife of a celebrity. And I, let, I was just letting her hear some songs for her husband. And she's like, you know what? I could have you a record deal in like a week. And I'm like, really? And I was like, I, I'm not sure if that's what I want to do. And she's like, well... If I, if I could get it, you know, would it be something that you would consider? And I'm like, yeah. So <clears throat> to make a short story even shorter, she just, she really got me a record deal with Atlantic in one week. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned that you got signed Atlantic, um, and then you started working on your first album. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the recording process of that album and some, some of the people you worked with on that album. Mm, I worked... Um, Primarily with Alonzo Jackson, which is my ex-husband. Okay. And we we did the bulk of the record. <clears throat> but um, before I got the record, when the, the record deal, that what actually got me the record deal was, hold on one second, Kyle. I'm sorry, I got to let my mom in. Yep, no problem. <laughs> Are getting the real, real. <laughs> yep. <laughs> She's here visiting. Okay. Okay, so um, where did I leave off? <laughs> Sorry. Um, like before the album, when you were recording. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, um, the songs that I had been writing were were not with my ex. He was actually like writing with other people, and it was kind of like a a struggle there where I couldn't really 
I was trying to prove myself as a writer in so many different ways. I was working a job <clears throat> at a furniture store in the mall. My life had, you know, life had just turned for me. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, what am I going to do? So um, I, I really started reading this book called The Prayer of Jabez and really focusing on asking God to bless me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which sounds like so weird to, you know, we, we pray for other people, but we never really pray for ourselves like that. So mm -hmm. I, um, had, I was really stuck on this book, on this book. So this woman, she makes this offer to me. Um, in the interim, I, I was working with this girl who had never written a song before. Her, her name is Tori Alamaze. <laughs> oh. Um, and she had never written, and she wanted me to help her write. In exchange of help, she was, at the time, she was outcast makeup artist. Okay. Um, so she was like, you know, I'll give you some tracks. If you write this jazzy face song with me, then I'll help you, you know, get some tracks for your writing because, you know, your husband isn't giving them to you or whatever. So we made that deal. I helped her write the song. And then she gave me a CD full of um, tracks from Family Tree, which was Blue Williams' former, former label. Okay. Um, former management company. And on it had... It had three songs from Outkast, three tracks from Outkast. Okay. And for, for whatever reason, everyone that had gotten these tracks, no one had written to those three. And I wrote to those three, and then I had this one from my ex, and those are the songs that got me my, my record deal with um, Hudson Miller and Craig Lindsay. I mean, I'm sorry, um, Craig Calment yep. at Atlantic. And um, it was just incredible, you know, to, to – I wasn't even, I was writing them for the purpose of maybe TLC or something like that, you know, not myself. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, that was an awesome experience to just be thrusted into something that I was, I was, you know, apparently I was ready for it, but I didn't know it at the time. And so once the um, record got underway, I of course worked with Outkast because they did those, those three songs. Um, well, actually we only used two of the three and then we wrote a new one. Mm -hmm. um, and I was pr just m mostly working with Andre 3000. <clears throat> and then I um, also worked with Jake and the Fat Man and Raphael Sadiq. Okay. Um, um, Kanye West. Okay. And, and I had uh, tons of features, like, because the album was called Menu. And people would say, hey, can I get an order of soul, you know, a side order of funk, that type of thing. So Jamie Foxx did the intro. Um, um, ugh, who else? De uh, Destiny's Child. They ordered. They made an order. Too short. Tommy Lee. It was just kind of like a, a way for me to show everyone the kind of people and music that influenced me. Oh. Um, Dr. Dre. Um, so it was pretty cool. It just didn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. You know what ended up happening with the album, and do you think we'll ever get to hear it? Um. I I was talking to some friends. I, I'm definitely going to do something. I just don't really know. Like, maybe somebody will hear, hear this and can let me know what to do. Like, I want to, you know, put it out there, but I don't want to. I do realize that it's a, a, um, a piece of work that was done 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, eight, eight years ago, whatever. And so I don't want to put it out there as a, as a new piece of music that I've done because I'm so not even there anymore. But I would like to somehow explore the opportunity of getting it out there. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I do want to put it out there. Um, I don't know if there was something else you asked me. My mom just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, a personal favorite song of mine is uh, the song Crazy. Um, I know that was going to be like your first single off that album. Uh, tell me about, you know, that song and what eventually happened to it. Okay, yeah, that's what you asked me. Um, Okay, so crazy, yeah, it was crazy. I, Kanye did the, the song, and it was featuring um, clips. Yep. And it was, I mean, my label was totally excited about it. This, I think this was like one of the last songs that I recorded. <clears throat> and they were like all gung-ho, like they start doing, you know, pressing up everything for it. They were ready to go with the, that being the first single, followed by another song called Number One from... Um, that Andre and I did. Okay. But um, what happened, what had happened was, <laughs> um, Joni Mitchell was not in the business of clearing samples <clears throat> because she did not want to support the U.S. economy during the war. Yeah. And so she didn't clear it. And we tried everything we could, 
had it been had Kanye been who he is now, then mm-hmm. then we probably would have you know gotten somewhere. But he did everything he he could. You know, he tried everything he could um, to get that sample cleared, and they just wouldn't clear it. And uh, so when, when, once that happened, and then um, Atlantic, they were just like, you know, that's basically that's what they saw as the first single. They didn't really know what to do. I didn't get dropped until maybe eight months later when the new um, the new structure came about, like when Lior and all of them came over there. Okay. Um, and Brandy got dropped before me. I was sitting there like, oh, my God, if they're dropping Brandy, what's going to happen now? And they just, you know, they actually, the label just took a turn and, and um, changed into something different. And I definitely probably wouldn't, to, wouldn't have fit in that, um, in that new structure. Okay, so, you know, you and Atlantic parted ways. Uh, you know, talk to me about what you were feeling after and, you know, you know, after mm-hmm. what happened. I was kind of feeling like, wow, you know, you, 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 you spend so much time and effort on a whole project and you believe in these people. You know, like I'm talking to them every day and I know it's like in, in the, a, the A&Rs, it's not really there. Um, they can't really do anything about it. They can fight for you until they're blue in the face. But at the end of the day... It's the, you know, the, the hierarchy that makes the decisions, who I was in contact with every day, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. So I was just, you know, it's kind of like, wow, okay, so <clears throat> what am I going to do now? And, but I had to get a hold of that really quickly because I had to remember that I'm a writer anyway and I can do whatever I want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, I know you were also Paris Hilton's vocal coach on her debut album, you know, uh-huh. what is it like working with her? And, you know, is there a balance somewhat, you know, from going to being a songwriter to a singer to a vocal producer? Um, well, no, because they all intertwine. That's something that I've always done. Like like I said, with the, with the group, the, the group that I was in, Image, it was <clears throat> it was a training ground for all of that because okay. I worked, um, I was a vocal coach in terms of, and vocal coach is not the right term, as a vocal producer. Okay. But I was a vocal producer for my group and uh, for myself, you know, in my own situation. And then so it was a natural progression for um, how that came about is I was working with Dr. Dre um, and he asked me to go. Paris Hilton asked him to come and work to come and do a song for him. Okay. And, <clears throat> and he was like, you know, I, you know, he wasn't going to do it. But who, you know, who can I ask to, to do this? And so he asked me to do it. Um, Scott Storch was doing a record, but he was like, who's going to actually sit there and work on the vocals with her? Who's going to sit, who's going to write the song? And so he asked me to do it. And of course I said, yes. Um, not, not knowing what I was getting myself into. Of course I went into it with preconceived notions like Paris Hilton. Yep. Like, what's she doing? But I was pleasantly surprised. Um, she has a, she, she has a nice voice and she, she has a great work ethic in terms of like, she wanted to get it done. And, and it was, I've seen some other people on TV recently, and I would say she definitely did a better job than others. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> now, I know you're also featured on Raphael Sadiq's first single, Good Man. Uh, talk mm-hmm. to me about the chemistry you guys have in the studio, because you guys you know, have worked together numerous times. Um, yeah, he's like, he's my family. Um, he's my brother. He's my friend. And... Um, and he he's easy to work with. <clears throat> he knows what he's doing. So he knows what he wants, I should say, especially for his own stuff. So there's never a question about, oh, is he going to like this? You know, sometimes you'll write a song and then you're wondering when you leave, did the person really like that? Or, you know, they, what are they going to change? Are they really, you know, are they really into what I'm saying? He'll let you know right there. Okay. Um, there's no, no uh, sugarcoating. He'll let you know, okay, I'm not saying that in a, or, you know, I, I want you to sing that. I'm not singing that. Or, you know, and, which was different for us in the way that we've written. I've never sang on anything. So that was crazy to, I'm like, okay, you want me to sing that? Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, working with him is awesome and something that I think I'll always do. Okay. Now, you know, what are you currently working on? I know you have your own artists. Uh-huh. I have Mark Knox. He's a, a soul artist. He's like a, he plays guitar, bass, um, piano and drums, and he's sort of like a Al Green Prince meets D'Angelo, <clears throat> and Raphael's helping me with, with his project as well, so 
Um, in addition to that, Raphael and I, we always just write, you know, the, the songs like the Overflow songs for his album, who, who knows, they'll end up going on someone. We've written lots of songs that we wrote, so many, you know, what I, is what I mean. And hopefully um, they'll go on some great artists. <clears throat> I'm also just working on writing again. Um, I just met with my publisher yesterday <clears throat> and just trying to get in a situation where I can, my value is seen, you know, for they're actually going to market me in a way to where they solicit me to artists that w appreciate what I do. Um, and I, you know, the, those artists could be on a small label, a big label. I'm just re really ready to work with different people who appreciate real music and timeless songs. I worked with Sunshine Anderson again. Um, I know we talked about her before. Mm -hmm. I worked with her last year and, and wrote two songs for her last album. <clears throat> One of which I wrote with Mark Knox, but she's she's had some amazing stuff going on it's just like so many good things under the radar um that is not on, on the forefront that people should really if you dig a little bit you can find some really good music out there yeah that's true um mm -hmm. and um i want to ask you this you know you've been in the music industry for a, a while now what do you mm -hmm. think is one thing you know you've learned from being in the industry um i, I kind of said it earlier that it all comes back like it all, you, you can see we've, you know, if you really sit down and you think about the trends and the, the, cra the crazy music, the silliness, the, the, the gangster stuff, the whatever, it all comes back to real music. It like, um, it all comes back to real hip hop. If, if we really, if you really think about it, you can, you can listen to all kinds of new silly stuff to your blue in the face, but uh, a classic hip hop song is still going to make the club rock you know mm -hmm. uh, and the classic um r&b song is still going to make get into the souls of and, and the minds of people and it's not and if you chase if you chase the trends and then that's all you have you become known as a person who has written this song and then you have your one hit and you're gone but if you pace yourself and you realize and you just you stand firm in knowing that it comes back around then you always have something to go to. Um, if you place your feet firmly in that, then you know that you can't be moved. That's that's what I that's what I've learned. Okay, and um, you know you've had the chance to write songs for Destiny's Child, um, you know Khalees, Raphael Sadiq, Sunshine Anderson. Um, is there someone that you want to write for that you haven't already? Um, Prince. <laughs> I would love to, I don't have to write for him. I could just go and sweep the floor in the studio. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I would love to write with Prince. Um, and a lot of people that I've written for, I would love to write with again. I, I had a dream of write, working with Little Dragon. And so I, and that was just like last year, like I wanted to work with them so bad. <clears throat> and I spoke that into existence because um, the song that they just don't, that's featured on Raphael's album there, that's on, out on Raphael's new album, Slow Rolling, they're featured on there. So I'm just going to keep speaking that I'll work with Prince, and I'm sure it'll happen. But there's so many people um, that I would love to work with, just people who are, have st stood firm and pe new, new people. I would love to work with Adele. Okay. Um, she writes timeless songs. Like, you know that those songs are going to be around forever. I would love to, to go to London and just work with, um, with a lot of different people that they have out there um, because they are very appreciative of of soul music. Mm -hmm. Now, Amy House, I would love to work with her. Like, she's an awesome writer, and I, I'd love to write write with writers who who get me and who I get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, um, how can the fans get in contact with you uh, via Twitter or Facebook? Um, at Tara T A U R A Stinson S T I N S O N. Um. I don't know if it's like on Facebook, you can just search me. My name is Tara Stinson. Okay. But, um, yeah, on Twitter, it's at, which, at Tara Stinson on Twitter. Okay, that's cool. Um, those are all the questions that I had prepared. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, I want to thank you for, for the interview. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know that you, um, I know we first met through the, the through um, the interview that we did about, um, Static, and yeah. I think that's you know so great that you keep his his legacy alive because he um, 
he was also a truly one of the greatest songwriters and vocal producers to live. Like he, he, his, his music is going to live on for so long. And that's exactly what I mean about like, there were so many trends around him. He stayed true to who he was. And if anything, he, the trends came to him and, um, and he's like a, a huge influence. And I, I thank you for keeping his legacy alive. Not a problem. And uh, just on a side note, I just realized I've been pronouncing your name wrong the entire time. What were you calling me? <laughs> Tora. I mean, it's okay because some people say Tara, some people say Tora. It doesn't make a difference. That's my mom throwing that you in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time. It's been an honor speaking with you. Oh, likewise, Kyle. Thank you so much. Yeah, you too. Ha take care. Okay, you too. Okay, bye-bye.